You ever feel like after playing a couple of games from the same studio, it's almost like you know the people who made these games and understand how they think? That kind of happened to me when I played Cyberpunk recently, just a couple of years after I played The Witcher 3. It blows my mind how much these games share in storytelling DNA, despite one being a medieval fantasy RPG and the other futuristic sci-fi. CD Projekt Red has this distinct style of storytelling that they perfected in The Witcher 3 and then repurposed in Cyberpunk to rather mixed results. Just to clarify, I've only played The Witcher 3 and Cyberpunk 2077, so I'm only going to talk about those. I will be playing The Witcher 2 sometime soon, so expect that in an upcoming video. I think the first time I got a sense of deja vu while playing Cyberpunk was when I met Johnny Silverhand for the first time. Both The Witcher and Cyberpunk have this really strange commonality. Their main stories revolve around a character as a MacGuffin. If you don't know what that is, a MacGuffin is an object or thing in a story that triggers the events of the plot. Think the One Ring from The Lord of the Rings or the Lost Ark from Raiders of the Lost Ark. These objects are extremely important to the characters in the story and serve as a catalyst that gets the plot going and intensifies the drama. The problem with most MacGuffins is that while the characters care about this object, the audience doesn't really give a damn. You might be curious what's inside the briefcase in Pulp Fiction, but it's not that important, right? It's the drama of all the characters trying to get their hands on it that makes for a compelling story. But CDPR turns that on its head by making their MacGuffins important characters themselves. Siri and Johnny Silverhand are effectively MacGuffins here because their very existence constantly drives the story forward. As Geralt searches for Siri, he finds himself embroiled deeper and deeper in the political conflicts raging in the northern realms, and Vee finds himself or herself facing off against authoritarian corporations and gangs who are trying to get their hands on Johnny Silverhand's consciousness. This has some really interesting consequences. For once, the audience is actually invested in these MacGuffins because they are characters with personality and emotion. Over the course of the games, you learn to understand and care about Siri or Johnny because just like you, they have motivations and desires and human flaws. They don't just set the story into motion, they play an active role in it. But Cyberpunk goes further than this by making Johnny Silverhand an integral part of the world he inhabits. Johnny embodies everything cyberpunk from the irreverent cockiness and brazen self-centered attitude to hating autocratic corporations and the capitalistic hellscape they've turned America into. In the beginning of the game, V and his partner Jackie are these brash young upstarts who started off in the streets and are looking for a shot to enter the big leagues, no different from anyone else in the lower levels of a criminal enterprise. The bright lights of the penthouses and flying cars of Night City are seductive, and what young man wouldn't want to be in one of those, surrounded by beautiful women, clinging crystal glasses with people whose net worth exceed the value of small nations, especially when his only other option is to fight over scraps tossed out by the rich and powerful. There's this void within V. One that he doesn't even realize he has as he enters Kanpeki Plaza, preparing for a high-stakes heist that ends up going very, very wrong. And poetically, Johnny Silverhand fills that void when V inserts his biochip into his brain. Cyberpunk 2077 isn't so much the story of V as it is the story of Johnny Silverhand told through the eyes of V. Because Johnny isn't simply the catalyst of the story; he's the very foundation of it. starting with when he set off a nuke in Arasaka Tower 57 years ago and ending with his final assault on that same building in the world of cyberpunk corporations had gained so much wealth and power they'd become as powerful if not more so than entire governments they turned america into an oligopoly a rich man's playground where big companies controlled average citizens access to basic resources They were effectively the new ruling class, funding their own private armies and controlling the world in a manner bearing unsettling resemblance to colonialism. This is the world V is vying for a chance to be a part of, and whether it's coincidence or destiny, all of that changes when Johnny Silverhand comes into the picture. Johnny is far from perfect. He's manipulative, belligerent, and self-serving, but he also stands unwaveringly for ideals far bigger than him. and is willing to sacrifice his own life fighting for freedom something we would never have even considered doing before they met 
he understands the world is a far bigger place than those penthouses and luxury cars it's the streets of night city the cd downtown apartments the hot stuffy nightclubs the bars the vast deserts of the badlands and the people inhabiting these places without ever meaning to V learns truths about the world and himself that would never have emerged to the surface were it not for this most absurd quirk of fate. For better or worse, he never be the same person after that. Listen, I realize I fucked up a lot of things. Either let down or used every last person who gave me their trust. Blind, selfish bastard that I was. But I've managed one thing for now. not to fuck this up what we have the only other games i've played with a companion character this important to the narrative is the last of us and 2018's god of war in both games the death of a loved one creates this yawning rift inside of the protagonists something they don't even realize they had but when circumstances force them on a journey with their companions those parts of them they'd hidden away so deeply begin to resurface and they find themselves fighting for something much more important than their own survival they find their own humanity in the unlikeliest of places staring back at them through the eyes of a child but johnny silverhand is more than just an important character in many ways he's also a tool for the game's world building and therein lies one of the biggest ways the witcher and cyberpunk differ in narrative structure See in the Witcher Geralt is this extremely important character who serves a central role not only in the main story but also in the lore of that world. He's had dealings with kings and emperors, helped sorcerers, elves and dwarves, and he's had a hand in shaping major events that have changed the course of history in the northern realms. The Witcher is his story. V on the other hand is a nobody. He's just a common thug, a gun for hire in a city overflowing with others just like him. That was by design because CDPR wanted a deeper role-playing experience in this game where you have complete control over your character like in a typical RPG. Besides, the world of Cyberpunk is a capitalistic nightmare where your only chance at a decent life is to get rich or die trying. Having your main character be someone important wouldn't exactly leave the same message. Given these differences, having Johnny Silverhand be your companion makes the world building process feel really personal. One of the biggest problems with world building is that it can often turn into mindless exposition where characters just explain stuff with zero emotional investment from the player. But Silverhand grounds the plot with his backstory, his motivations, his fears, and most importantly, his humanity. You start off not giving a shit about Silverhand or the people that have wronged him. But through his journey you start to realize why he does the things he does why he hates these big faceless corporations so much and why his fight needs to become your fight it's a difficult but ultimately transformative journey that changes we as a person and it made me realize that despite all the unkept promises missing features and bugs i really like cyberpunk 2077 It also made me realize that Cyberpunk is not a very good open world RPG. One of the core tenets of any good open world game and one that most of them seem to overlook these days is that the world itself is the real hero of the story. Your main character may be important, but if the player isn't having meaningful interactions with the open world, having a huge map becomes a chore instead of an opportunity to explore. It's really difficult to tell a compelling story in an open world game because it's almost impossible to create tension or urgency when the player also has to be given the freedom to do what they want. But it's also a unique opportunity to tell a sweeping massive story on a grander scale than any linear game ever could. The Witcher 3 is the story of the Northern Realms and the invasion of Nilfgaard, an event that throws several kingdoms into turmoil. disrupts quiet rural communities with violence and famine and magical events that threaten to throw the world off balance but that's just a bird's eye view on the ground the drudgery of daily life and household kitchen politics are still the main focus for most people a couple of washerwomen in novigrad gossiping about their neighbor's husband if your husband set out on a voyage never came back how would you feel well, my husband was never dug out of the worst dives in novigrad day in day out Think he drank himself to death. It's possible. 
That or someone knifed him, tossed his body in the channel. Or a random townsman complaining to a holy priest about his neighbor's suspicious activities amidst a citywide panic about magic users. Fire. He has guests. Suspicious individuals. They meet weekly. Strange noises come from inside. Flashes. You've done well to tell me, my son. The temple guard must investigate. Novigrad must be cleansed of all magic practices. The best thing about open world games is, when done right, they can be about anything you want them to be. The first time I played The Witcher, I barely paid attention to these small details scattered around the world. But now that I'm playing it for the second time, I'm relishing the experience of taking in this world at a slower pace, one idle conversation at a time. It's the sort of freedom you can only expect to have in a world that's so immensely full of detail, so carefully crafted down to the last roof tile or tree branch, that you're not playing a game anymore, but disappearing into a fictional world as if you never belonged anywhere else. Recently, I was reading The Witcher books by Andrei Sapkowski, and I was struck by how well The Witcher 3's minor and often inconsequential side quests fit the short story format of the first two books. The thing I enjoyed most about some of Sapkowski's short stories was how a lot of them are pretty low stakes, in that one story didn't really move the plot forward or make a huge impact on Geralt as a character. Instead, these stories were more like filler episodes that took an intimate look at the lives of ordinary folk, their daily struggles living in a world populated by non-humans, magic users, monsters, and well, other humans. Sapkowski isn't interested in trying to impress you with deep lore or brilliant spectacle. Rather, he's inviting you to take a walk in this richly detailed world he's created. For this reason, The Witcher 3, in my opinion, is the most narratively and thematically perfect recreation of these stories, despite the games being so different from the books. Geralt is a travelling sword for hire whose entire life is a patchwork of stories big and small, sprawled across the various kingdoms of the continent. Individual quests would be inconsequential by themselves, but taken together, they weave the frayed and chaotic tapestry of the Northern Realms as a whole, and Geralt's brief but lasting impression on it. I just don't get that with cyberpunk. The world is beautiful and richly detailed, but only on the surface. There's very few interesting NPC interactions, almost no trivial side quests that exist purely to draw you deeper into the game's world. The story is so absorbed with V and Johnny Silverhand that it doesn't really get to stretch its legs with more varied ideas. Night City is just a backdrop for a bunch of well-choreographed missions with some really well-written characters, but that's kind of it. As I said, it's a great game and would probably be fantastic as a Bioshock-esque linear adventure. It's just not a good open world. Even when the game does have an opportunity to supersede The Witcher, it ends up falling short. For example, The Witcher has this rather uninspired way of giving the player new quests. The quest board. You go to a town, pick up all the quests from the quest board, and find the ones you want from the menu. It makes the process of finding new quests very one-dimensional, rather than having you stumble upon them in the open world. I get why they did this. It's a big map, and players could easily end up missing some very interesting content. Cyberpunk's solution seems much more interesting, at least on the surface. Different parts of Night City have different fixers, who are sort of like middlemen between mercenaries like V and clients looking to get a job done discreetly. Job like any other, just the clients will demanding. This would have been the perfect opportunity for some really interesting interactions. Maybe the fixer changes the plan midway, or helps you out if you've built up a good relationship with them, or has a bigger role to play in certain missions. In fact, there is one quest where you can choose to finish the job according to the client's wishes or follow the fixer's orders and get a better pay. I see you do not ask unnecessary questions, V. You simply do what is asked of you. I admire such an approach, and I know how to compensate it. But generally, all that happens is that you get the occasional call or text from these characters, they explain the job to you in a short conversation, and your new mission can be found in the menu. <sighs> but I have to give credit where it's due. Some of Cyberpunk's missions are outstanding. Both The Witcher and Cyberpunk have this interesting structure to their quests that works really well from both narrative and gameplay perspectives. 
there's three tiers of quests you see in both games. Primary quests are your main story missions. These are compulsory if you want to progress the story. Secondary quests are the supporting character side missions and these are arguably the best parts of both games. In The Witcher, these quests happen with Yennefer, Triss, Dandelion and other important characters who share a close relationship with Geralt. In Cyberpunk, these missions have you alongside Pan Am, Judy, River, Johnny and a couple of others. Secondary quests aren't necessary to complete the main story, but you're kind of missing out on half the game if you skip them. They also generally ask you to make choices that affect the ending of the game in some way, so they have a clear tie into the main story. Finally, optional quests are all the ones that are completely, well, optional and won't affect anything in the story if you skip them. This three tier format is perfect for open world games because it doesn't put all the burden on the main story to provide big action set pieces or emotional moments while also letting the player choose which supporting character they want to spend more time with. I particularly remember how hard it was for me to choose between Triss and Yennefer and I had a blast getting together with Johnny Silverhand's old rock band for one last performance. But the optional quests, I think, are where Cyberpunk falls totally short of the high bar set by The Witcher 3. In The Witcher, side quests were an opportunity to be more than the protagonist of a story. They let you get involved in the more mundane events of the world and make your presence felt on a smaller, more intimate scale. I still remember the quest where I was hired by some villagers to find what happened to a group of miners who'd gone to a cave to mine silver. When you go there, you meet a cave troll that had killed the miners after they'd invaded his home and refused to leave even after the troll asked them to. The game lets you decide whether to kill the troll if you think it was guilty or spare it and face the anger of the villagers who hired you. Left him in peace. Advise you to do the same. <laughs> Turn courage, you mean? What kind of monster slayer are you? Out of my sight! And as you can see, this isn't some binary good versus evil choice you're being asked to make. That autonomy to influence something tangible makes me feel like an active participant in the world, rather than a passive spectator. If the same quest was in Cyberpunk, it would probably go like this. You get a call from a fixer telling you about the troll, you go there and see the miner's dead bodies, you fight and kill the troll, then when you loot him you find a message that tells you that the troll was in fact trying to be peaceful and ask the humans to leave. You feel bad for the troll, the quest ends, the money is credited to your account. The end. See what I mean? It almost feels like those messages you see all over the place are the developers from CDPR telling you they had bigger plans for this quest or that mission but just didn't have the time to see it through to the end. The game has all these exciting quests that start to explore fascinating concepts of morality in the future, mind manipulation using technology, and the question of humanity in an age of advanced cyberware. But it sees almost none of these ideas through to the end, and is forced to leave these tantalizing loose ends that hint at what the game could have done with it, but ultimately failed because of corporate greed and short-sighted leadership. If that isn't tragically ironic, I don't know what is. CD Projekt Red is one of the most fascinating studios in the industry. It started off as two friends selling cracked copies of western video games in high school back when communist Poland barely had a market for games. Their first game, back in 2007, kinda sucked. And in 2015, just 8 years later, they gave us one of the greatest video games ever made. I used to be a huge CDPR fan back when I was playing The Witcher 3 and I felt kind of betrayed when Cyberpunk 2077 released. The lies, the manipulative and shady review embargoes, the corners upon corners cut for the sake of an early release and the deceptive marketing hype cycle that promised way too much way too soon. The catastrophic launch of Cyberpunk taught me that no matter how hard they try to make it seem that way, corporations are not our friends. It's a reminder that companies don't make games, people do. That's why I continue to be optimistic about the future of The Witcher and Cyberpunk and whatever else the devs at CDPR will make in the future. These people know how to tell a fantastic story and they're one of the few that have understood and almost perfected the open world formula with The Witcher 3. Now they just need to do it again. What are your favorite open world games and why do you like them so much? Drop a comment, it's just below the like button. Thanks so much for watching Next Level Narrative. 
I really hope you enjoyed this video because I really enjoyed making it. I'm planning to make lots more videos like this in 2022, so it would be awesome if you get subscribed. Anyway, see you guys next time. This is your host, Anish Bhargav, signing out.